podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Just a little caveat before we begin. This webinar is a general communication being provided for informational purposes only. Right, well, welcome and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Michael Booth, and uh, I work for St. James's Place as a consultant. Today's webinar topic is the survival guide to working from home. Now, this is part one of a series that we'll be hosting on this topic. And the main reason that we are discussing this is due to COVID-19 and the pandemic that we all find ourselves in. Working from home has become the new normal, but it's not really normal, is it? Um, this transition phase has been a little bit um, difficult for myself personally. I'm sure it has for many of the audience with us today. Um, but this transition presents us with a new set of challenges for mental and physical uh, wellness. So in today's session, we are joined by two experts, um, and we're going to be discussing tips on how to optimize your posture for better comfort, um, and also to reduce your fatigue and stress. What we're aiming to do is help to make things more productive for you while working remotely. Um, so joined with me today, we have Dr. Tim Errington. So Dr. Tim, can you give us a little wave? <laughs> um, Dr. Tim is owner and founder of Total Health Chiropractic. He's a doctor of chiropractors and author and professional speaker. So Dr. Tim, thank you for being with us today. Um, we are also joined by Michael Bushal, who is an APA titled musculoskeletal therapist, physiotherapist. <laughs> an IOC sports physiotherapist at InTouch Physio here in Singapore. So gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us. All right, so could we please now run through the agenda, Tizzy? Very good. All right, so we're gonna begin with Dr. Tim, who is going to walk us through the art and science of working from home, uh, followed by Marco, and we're going to be discussing the myth of perfect posture, active versus passive strategies for the prevention of mechanical pain. And followed by that, we'll have a Q&A section. So as we're going through this, I'm sure um, our participants are going to have a few questions. Please feel free to drop your questions in the box and we'll be discussing it in the Q&A section. Um, we are hoping to be finished at about 1 p.m. today. And that will be the, the closing and the end of the program. So um, without further ado, we're going to pass over to Dr. Tim. Um, so I will now off my camera and hand over to you for the art and science of working from home. Hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be here uh, today. What I would like to do is, as I, uh, as I always do, is try and do as much good as I can. Uh, we're going to be talking about some ergonomic tips. I call it the art and science of working from home. Uh, a presentation that I've been asked to do many, many times for uh, lots of uh, multinationals ar around the region. Uh, I've got a very condensed version for you today. So uh, I've got quite a bit to go through, so we're going to move on. So uh, first slide, please. So just a little bit about, my, about myself. I am the owner and founder of Total Health Chiropractic, uh, and I wrote a, a book a few years ago called Posture Matters. And that's because when I came here to Singapore, I realized how many people succumb to bad posture. Uh, and since writing that, I've been on pretty much all the stages uh, and in all the media, um, while we've been growing our clinics to five clinics with 10 doctors. And because postural problems are such a problem, uh, we now see over 1,200 clients every single week. Uh, let's go to the next slide. What I'd like to do is initially, because I'm a chiropractor, I want to introduce you to your default position. So already some of you will be slumping in your seats, right? It's the end of the morning. You've probably been at your desk for a while and already gravity is taking you into that position. So that slouch, slouch posture you see on the left. Let's, let's look at good posture just for a moment and I'm gonna ask you to reset yourself, okay? This is gonna become your default. So go ahead and and please, everyone join me here. Lift your sternum, open your shoulders, pull your head back on your shoulders, 
and engage your abs. You'll see that you've got a little curve in your low back. This is healthy. What you are now in is a good default position. So try and remember this because I want you to, from now on, go back to this position probably a couple of times every hour, okay? Uh, and then I've written on the bottom there, move. We are designed to move as a species. We're meant to be moving. Probably the healthiest people on the planet don't even exercise because their life is constant activity, movement, just, just staying alive. Um, let's go to the next slide. So I think you'll all agree with me that health that we want is the most important wealth. You know, we work very hard for our money, but the greatest wealth is your health. And how do I know that? Because I know how much people are willing to spend at the end of life or, or not even necessarily at the end of life. But as you start to lose your health, you start hemorrhaging money as you try and regain that health. Uh, I think you agree that we want a long life excuse me, we want to avoid disease and degeneration. We want to be energetic and vital our whole life, not just while we're young. And we want to be happy and comfortable in our own bodies. It's a, it's a tragedy when people are not comfortable in the very vessel that carries, carries them through life. We want to be as pain-free as possible. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Because because um, most of you are probably sitting at your desk right now, many of you will already be suffering from neck pain and shoulder stiffness, low back and headaches. These are probably the, the most common things that I see, see people with. These, these are the signs and symptoms of modern life, working in these corporations, working at a computer. In fact, why don't you go ahead and write in the, in the, in the chat box you'll see, you'll see there on the, on the screen, why don't you tell us what is your main problem? Are you a shoulder? Uh, person or are you a low back or if your headaches just go ahead it gives us an idea and also what would be interesting for us all is how many hours do you spend at a computer i get blows me away sometimes when some people write 12 or 14 or whatever i know that if you spend more than five hours a day at your computer in, a, in this position it's doing irreparable damage so you know it's something you need to be aware of let's move go on to the next slide please so I want you to have a reality check, if you like, that this process that is our life is about growth. Once we reach maturity, we then change and adapt. And this is the aging process, if you like. But one thing that I know, there's so, so much evidence, is that your shape, your form, your posture is going to determine how you age. And if you look on this, this illustration, this little guy on the left looks pretty young. Look at his position, he's slumped forward. I know it's only an illustration, but he looks like he's already suffering from back pain. But if he adopts this position for more than five hours a day, every day, he's growing into that position. You become what you do all day, every day. And I don't want anybody on this call to, to grow into this, this old guy you see on the right with the two walking sticks. Posture is a major cause of pain, suffering, in this modern life. This is a world of cause and effect, action and reaction, if you like. Let's go to the next slide. So just a little bit of physiology here, okay? That's how the body works. There's your brain on top of the spine. And it has to, brain has to communicate through the central nervous system, which is inside the spine. And then it, you have all these little branches of the nerves, the, the peripheral nerves that go to all your organs. We can see, I think it's quite evident that we need to have clear, un uninterrupted flow. I'm gonna mention that word a few times, flow. Flow of energy backwards and forwards between the brain and the body, and then the body communicates back to the, uh, back to the brain. Very, very important. But when we take a little peek inside the body, you can see other, there's an, a lot of other stuff going on. And quite clearly, we need enough space. And this is why posture is so, so important. While the nervous system controls everything in the body, we also have got to have efficient breathing and blood circulation. We need, the, we need good flow of everything that is vital to our lives. And postural distortions, which is, which is basically the shape of your spine, the shape that you hold yourself all day, every day, these will always cause effects, detrimental effects to the transmission, the flow 
of the most important things that you have, which is your blood, your oxygen, and your nerves. You really need to start, if, you haven't, if you're not thinking like this, please, you need to start thinking in terms of your spine being a vital organ. Next slide, please. So this is something that, I, this is the reason I wrote my book. I came to Singapore and I saw so many people with the sitting disease. And what's happening is that they're basically developing postural stress dis disorder, spinal deconditioning, if you like. We know that with the body, if you don't use it, you lose it. And that can be function, it could be anything to do with the body. It needs activation, it needs function. So this old lady in the illustration looks already like she's tight, and stiff and uncomfortable. You can see her organs are gonna be depressed. She will have decreased blood flow, decreased oxygen, and lymph, the lymph is not going to be effectively working. And the, the lymph, very importantly, drains all the toxins out of the body. We need movement. We need flow. Let's go to the next slide, please. So what I'm going to do uh, today is I'm just going to introduce you to a few strategies that you can start to apply. And we're going to look at your setup. And this is a more of a professional setup. But then I'm going to, look, I'm going to introduce you to how I set myself up when I'm working perhaps in, in a coffee shop, Starbucks, or, or, or anywhere really. And I'm gonna demonstrate on my, on my dining room table behind me. So let's look at the professional setup. Uh, some of you at home might be lucky enough to have uh, the right equipment. Um, many of you won't, but I'm gonna talk about what we're trying to achieve. So starting with the head, that wants to be upright and above our shoulders. Eyes should be about the height of the top of your screen, looking down slightly perhaps. Your shoulders want to be relaxed and down. Too many people live their lives with there's so much tension in their shoulders. Our back ideally wants to be supported by a backrest. You can see this person here um, is sitting back in the chair and there is a, there is a, a lumbar support, which is, which is giving this support to the, the low back, helping maintain that vital, vital, low back curve. Um, the wrists want to be neutral. Too many people end up with wrist problems. The screen wants to be in front of you and not to one side with your wrists neutral. Elbows and knees want to be at 90 degrees or slightly more. You don't want to have restriction in the joints by having not, not enough uh, space. Uh, it interferes with blood flow, etc. Okay, so elbows and knees ideally want to be at around about 90 degrees or slightly more. So think about how you're setting your chair, the height, and you set that to the height of the table. Um, while we're talking about the elbows, you see in this chair there is, a, there is a, an armrest. If you have one, use it. Too many people don't. You can bring that armrest to literally just below the level of the table, and that's going to take all the weight of... Of, uh, off your shoulders. A lot of that strain that everybody seems to have in the shoulders comes from the leverage weight of your arms, okay? So use the, use the armrests. You be sensible. Think about what we're trying to achieve here. Ideally, your thighs will be about 90 degrees uh, and your feet ideally will be supported on the floor. If you are short leg, perhaps, can we say, then perhaps you, you might need a, a foot rest that will bring um, that will bring the legs up because you don't want too much weight on the back of your legs because that, again, will interfere with blood supply. So, so that's the professional setup. If anybody has any questions, please go ahead, engage with us on the, on the chat, and we'll, we'll try and make sure you understand uh, what we're doing here. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So now that we are in this working from home situation, the new normal that we are we are coping with. Many people are working on laptops, which is causing many, many problems. The problems with the laptops is they're too small. The, the monitors attach the keyboard. It's just not adaptable, adjustable. Um, it's all very compact and it's very hard to get an effective setup. So there are solutions, whether it be docking stations, stands. I'm going to show you in a moment what I use. So I want you to think about your own setup and um, think about how you can apply it to your life, okay? I myself, I'm gonna show you how I use Bluetooth, mouse, keyboard, um, and I make something that really is effective so I can work for many hours without pain building up. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna move uh, to my, my, 
remote workstation and show you how I set it up. So we're going to go on to the main screen. Okay, so this is my tiny room table. And what I'm going to do is just show you how I set myself up. So I'm just going to go ahead and sit down and see where I am. So I know that I preset the height of the chair so that I can get my arms on the table. I used a towel. I just, I adapted what I have in the house. So I want to be, so when I sit up, um, my arms are going to be my, my armrest because my chair doesn't have an armrest. So my arms are going to be my armrest. So I'm going to push everything away. There we go. And what I've done is I've got my laptop. I I have a very simple $30 stand here. And I've got that on the book to bring it up to the right height. And the top of my screen is at around about eye height. Okay. Um, already I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, I've got a Bluetooth keyboard. I've got a Bluetooth mouse. Okay. So let's see. How do I feel? Um, okay. The height's okay. Um, I feel pretty good. One thing that's not good is it, I'm slumping a bit. So I've got a little towel here. We should have some kind of support for our lower back. So I'm going to pop that in there. Legs 90 degrees, arms 90 degrees. Support for my shoulders, my head back on my, my shoulders. And I've got Bluetooth. And you know, I am ready to go. You know, this, this is a very efficient setup. It's very inexpensive very easy to achieve. So anybody who's got any queries on this or any questions how you can adapt your situation, mm -hmm. go ahead and pop something in the chat. Okay, I hope that helps. And we can go back to the main screen. And what I'm going to do is just going to fly through some very, very simple stretches. Okay, so these are things that I think that we should all do not necessarily on a daily basis, perhaps even a couple of times a day, but please start thinking about your body. It's communicating you with signs and symptoms. So start thinking about how to move your neck because your neck, uh, um, people always end up having some neck problems and shoulder problems. So stretch out those, um, those neck muscles in all six ranges of, of motion. Okay, next slide. I'm just gonna move quickly here to get through my simple stretches. Uh, your shoulders take a real hammer, so start to think, think about them. Stretch them and move them, get the blood flow, okay? Pull those shoulder blades together to open up the shoulders. Next slide, please. So, this, the, so most of you will, be, will know what a cat cow is. So basically we're arching our back, and we're slumping forward, we, we are flexing our spine. You can do this a few times and it will work the, the very important discs in your spine. Very, very good, uh, simple thing you can do. Next slide. So seated twists, we not only want to flex and extend, we want to rotate our spine. I do this on my chair by simply, I hold the desk and I turn my chair on its, on its axis. And it, I get a nice twist, okay? So do, do, do get used to doing things like this. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so there's me on my foam roller, um, rolling my stress away. When we spend too much time in flexion, we really do want to spend time in extension. So we can balance the, the, these detrimental forces that are building up in our body. These forces of gravity, which, which cause all, all the trouble. Um, so get a get a foam roller that costs nothing and do this you know, a few times a week. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is something that I do most days because shoulder problems, low back problems are very prevalent. So I do it on my chair. I just literally push myself way head down and I really get a good stretch in my shoulders and it opens the low back. And of course, you can see how this is done on the floor. Um, again, very, very good. Uh, to concentrate on the lumbar spine and the, sh the shoulders opening them up. Uh, next slide. And then low back. If you've got an achy low back, which is many of you will have, I'm, I'm sure, learn how to lie on the floor, pull your knees up to open up those discs, and then perhaps you can, like, like the illustration on the right, just, just bend your legs and twist from side to side. It's like a windscreen wiping your legs from side to side. Get some really good movements in, in those discs. It will help. You know, the, the most important thing with these exercises is that you do them, okay? Just make some healthy habits. And let's go to the next slide. So just a simple warning. There are times when you really don't want to be self-treating. Uh, 
I believe if you're, if you're getting any tingling or numbness or pain that won't go away or it's radiating down the arms or legs, uh, these are signs of nerve interference, okay? Then the nerves are now being compromised. You really need to see an expert, okay? Um, if you're getting daily headaches, again, this is the body telling you that something is wrong. Uh, many of these headaches are tension, they're coming from the neck, easily to fix, okay? And if you're seeing any structural changes, so, you know, maybe your head's going forward, maybe you're getting a lump growing on the back of your neck, or maybe the muscle on one side of your spine is getting bigger than the other. These are, these are signs of, of structural imbalance, and it's probably best to see a professional so we can give you the right, um, put, put, you, put you on the right path, okay? Um, one thing about posture is that nobody is perfect, we have to deal with what we've got. Um, it is going to go a long way to de determining how much health you have in your body in the future. So it's just a matter of working with your body and just be, uh, know, just understand that the world we live in takes you away from good posture. So we really want to be as good as we can be. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So um, I like to pop this on the end. Every, everywhere we go, we like to do, um, we work with our partners. Um, St. James Place is a, is, a, is a very good partner uh, for ourselves. So all of you that are watching this can uh, to please take a photograph of this, of this live. If anybody needs any attention or needs to come in and perhaps you're having any signs or symptoms, then go ahead. Normally it's $170 to see one of our, uh, one of our chiropractors. For you uh, as, as attendees today, it would be only 45. So make sure you get that scan. And I'd like to thank you for listening. I've been very quick. Um, and um, yeah, thank you very much. Enjoy that. Cool. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tim. So now we'll be proceeding to the next slide, please, Tizzy. Um, Michael, could you come on? There you are. All right. So guys, now over to Michael Bouchon, and we're going to be talking about the myth of perfect posture active versus passive strategies for the prevention of mechanical pain. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. And I'd like to extend uh, my gratitude to TC, Charles, and yourself, Michael, for the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, my name is Michael Bushell. Uh, I've been a physiotherapist for 25 years, and I've had the good fortune of working in the jurisdictions of Australia, the United Kingdom, Hong Kong, and now Singapore. And today I would like to present to you the myth of perfect posture and discuss how active versus passive strategies contribute to the prevention of mechanical pain. And mechanical pain is any pain in your body that does not originate from nerve tissue or neurological structures or non-mechanical causes like infection, or neoplastic lesions such as tumours. Next slide, please. Firstly, let's ask the question, what is posture? In 2017, there was a comprehensive review of all of the quality clinical research available on posture. And the authors synthesised that data to come up with an evidence-based definition of posture. And it is the outcome of the overall positions of the joints adapted to balance the skeletal segments against gravity in any given position, serving as a basis for movement and body language that is maintained by muscles and under the control of the nervous system. So from this point, it's essential to understand posture is an end product of our muscles capacity to coordinate a state of balance that allows a comfortable position or efficient movement. And that posture is moderated by surrounding ergonomics. And it's also modulated by our moods and feelings, which manifest as body language. And there's something important to understand here. It is that it's the commands from our nervous system that activates our muscles to be able to resist gravity in any position. It's not the bones and joints that hold us up. If we stripped all the muscles off our bodies, we'd simply be a pile of bones on the floor. Next slide, please. 
So here's a flow chart that illustrates the components required to achieve an optimal postural outcome. I'd like to briefly refer to ergonomics and our emotions and their influence on posture, and then spend the majority of time detailing the components of physical capacity and our neuromuscular control and the significant influence they can have on a given postural outcome. Next slide, please. But currently, there is no quality evidence to suggest that adopting a certain posture can cause neck or back pain. And nor is there any evidence to support the notion that rigid upright sitting or standing is in fact the perfect posture in preventing neck and back pain. Uh, the current narrative in the data, it challenges this whole concept of a perfect singular posture. And there's emerging evidence that suggests it may be a variability of positions throughout the day may offer better postural outcomes. Nonetheless, it may remain appealing to think that sitting up straight will prevent back pain, but this is just simply not supported by large studies conducted in many countries. Even experienced physiotherapists themselves are in disagreement as to what constitutes the so-called perfect posture. Uh, however, we do know what factors contribute to a poor postural outcome, and poor posture is created by a thing called postural stress. Next slide, please. Now, postural stress can be created by any self-imposed position that inflicts unnecessary or excessive physical demand on our body. An example of this occurred earlier this year when some of us moved from our accustomed, familiar, and often ergonomically assessed office environments to the home, uh, either at the kitchen table, the desk in the spare bedroom, the couch, or even the floor. Now, those positions in and of themselves aren't dangerous. However, they can be posturally challenging to get comfortable in. And as Dr. Tim outlined in his earlier presentation, some simple ergonomic evaluations can be very useful in setting up an appropriate workstation while working from home. Next slide, please. The next component I'd like to talk about is how our emotions that are expressed in the form of our body language can influence any given postural outcome. Next slide, please. Our emotions, they have a direct influence on posture and our moods and feelings are directly related to the quality of our sleep and the levels of personal and work-related stress that we're experiencing. Now, these emotions are manifest through our body language, which in turn can impact the amount of postural stress we're exposed to. So I'd just like you to take a moment to visualize how someone would look in sitting when they're feeling happy, or if they're feeling relaxed, or when they're feeling motivated. And now think about how they would look in sitting when they're feeling tired, or if they're feeling apathetic, or even sad. It's under the unconscious or subconscious rather influence of our emotions. Most of the time we reach a postural outcome that's not deliberate, it just merely reflects how we're feeling at that point in time. And how we're feeling is directly modulated by the quality of our sleep and the levels of our stress. Further, we also know that periods of broken sleep or sleep deprivation and all forms of psychological stress have strong pro-inflammatory effects and that can create tissue tension and muscular soreness. Most people don't understand that when you are sleep deprived or stressed or even both, you can get mechanical neck and back pain. Next slide, please. Now the next influence on our ability to cope with postural stress is where we can have the most positive impact. That is by enhancing our physical capacities 
in the form of strength, endurance, and fitness, and increase the competence of our neuromuscular control to more effectively deal with postural stress and address the causes of fatigue that we may experience through the day. Next slide, please. So if your muscular system is challenged beyond its current capacity in a given position, or if your nervous system is not adaptable enough to control a given position for a period of time, you're engaging in a postural challenge that increases postural stress and can result in fatigue. Now, the impacts of that fatigue may manifest themselves as uh, pain, stiffness, or tension. Rarely has this got anything to do with range of motion or flexibility. Now, if you're unfortunately leading an inactive and sedentary lifestyle, your body will be less able to resist fatigue. It will be less resilient and less likely to cope with the intermittent periods of increased postural stress that you experience. And this brings us to the contrasting effects of passive strategies versus active strategies in dealing with postural stress and fatigue. Next slide, please. So a passive strategy by nature of the word is where we are not activating our muscles via the voluntary ignition of our own nervous system. We know that passive strategies are very useful in offering the transient and temporary relief of symptoms such as pain, stiffness and tension. Or rather, they're useful in relieving the impacts of postural stress and fatigue. Passive strategies deal with symptoms and do not address the causes. Some examples of passive strategies that we may be familiar with are massage, static stretching, therapist applied joint mobilizations and manipulations, the modalities of heat, ice, medication, acupuncture, dry needling, some electrotherapies like transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, foam rolling and the like. This is simply where either we as a whole person or a particular body region is passive or inert during the intervention. Next slide, please. Now we know these strategies can be very enjoyable and relaxing due to the symptomatic relief that they offer. Uh, and they're often necessary in the early stages of managing symptoms like pain, stiffness, or tension. But they do not address our physical capacity or neuromuscular control to deal with current or future postural stress and fatigue. We also know if you're currently symptom-free, passive strategies may be even more limited in their effect as they are reduced to short-term and transient effects only. Next slide, please. So conversely, an active strategy is where we are in fact activating our own muscles via the voluntary ignition of our nervous system. And that induces physiological tissue adaptations in the form of increased strength, improved endurance, and more neuromuscular control. Now, active strategies are imperative in the prevention of symptoms because they directly address the causes of postural stress and fatigue themselves. Simply put, an active strategy encompasses all forms of exercise. Now, this exercise can specifically target the muscles of the neck and shoulders, or the muscles of the back, pelvis, and lower limbs. Or it can be more general in just about any form of active motion, fitness training, or sports participation. The options are almost endless, just as are the health benefits. For example, Pilates, yoga, football, badminton, jogging, swimming, circuit training, brisk walking, Zumba classes, any form of dancing, cycling, F45, CrossFit training, netball, Tabata circuits, boxing, basketball, exercise videos on YouTube, 
Anything that requires you to move your body and that challenges your strength, endurance and control will do it. And what's important is not to get hung up on the type of exercise you're doing. You need to find something you enjoy because you're more likely to stick to it and make it part of your everyday lifestyle. The fact that you're engaging in an active strategy is the most vital issue. Next slide, please. We know initially this requires effort from ourselves. However, it increases our physical capacities and enables us to cope better with the postural stress and fatigue we experience. But more importantly, it contributes to preventing that postural stress and fatigue in the first place. Now, this cannot be achieved by perpetually lying on a therapist's treatment table, being massaged, mobilised or manipulated. Now, in case you didn't know, I would like to briefly summarise the benefits of active strategies on all other body systems other than the musculoskeletal system. Did you know that exercise enhances our metabolic function by decreasing our fat stores and increasing lean muscle tissue? which can improve our blood glucose and lipid profiles and reduce our risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Did you know that exercise enhances our cardiovascular health by increasing our heart and lung function and regenerating and creating new blood vessels to reduce your risk of heart disease and stroke? Did you know exercise enhances our hormonal function by increasing growth hormone production and other neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin, which are incredibly protective of our brain cells and can not only reduce our risk of developing dementia, but can improve our executive cognitive functions. And that's the scientific term for our problem solving abilities. Did you know that exercise enhances our immune system by decreasing markers of inflammation and increasing the efficiency of white cell production? This can reduce our susceptibility to certain common infections. Did you know that exercise can enhance our psychological well-being and re reduce our risk of developing some de depression and anxiety related disorders? And did you know that if you accumulate 150 minutes of exercise in a week, say by five sessions of 30 minutes, you can reduce your risk of all causes of mortality by 33%. So that's right. If you exercise re regularly, you can reduce your risk of death by one third. So I'm asking you, where are you devoting your time or focusing your energy or investing your money? Now, if all of those wonderful benefits were available in a tablet, would you take it? Would I take it? Well, I would say no, because there is one more amazing benefit that exercise can potentially offer, and that is the social interaction with other humans, albeit limited in these current times. However, exercise offers the potential to develop and foster new friendships and relationships. And we know that research that's been conducted all over the world by including surveys of elderly populations, the results has consistently and overwhelmingly shown that one of the primary ingredients in leading a happy and fulfilling life is to foster and develop friendships and relationships which are enjoyable and enriching in the good times and even the tough times. Exercise has the potential to offer you that. You can't get that in a tablet. Next slide, please. So just to recap in conclusion, posture is an outcome influenced by quality ergonomics, our emotions and resulting body language, and our current physical capacities and neuromuscular control. We know passive strategies are very useful in providing temporary and transient relief of symptoms related to the postural stress and fatigue we experience. And even if we are free of symptoms, we know that passive strategies are even more limited in their effects. Active strategies are imperative in addressing the postural stress and fatigue themselves. They can not only manage symptoms, 
but more importantly, they can prevent symptoms. So when we have pain, stiffness or tension, initially passive strategies are really useful in helping control those. However, there needs to be a transition of prescription to more active strategies to better offer the opportunity for an improved outcome and a longer, more lasting outcome. Next slide, please. So I would like us all to take a moment to perform an active strategy. So those of us that are sitting, let's stand up. And if you're standing, just remain so. So hopefully we're all standing. What I'd like you to do, we're going to perform two movements. And I'd like you to pay attention to the sensations in your lower back. So firstly, let's all bend backwards and pay attention to how the lower back feels. Okay, that's great. We're going to do the same thing and bend forwards. Pay attention to how your lower back feels and also pay attention to where your fingertips reach as we bend over. Okay, fantastic. So, this active strategy, I'd like everyone to bend your knees. We're going to do six sets of five second holds. I would like you to now clench your buttocks and firm your tummy muscles. Now hold that contraction with moderate force and concentrate your attention on keeping your buttocks clenched and your tummy nice and firm. Okay, and now relax. Okay, let's bend our knees again. Moderately squeeze your buttocks together. Now firm your tummy muscles and let's hold that for five seconds. And just focus your mind on keeping the buttocks clenched and the tummy tight. And now relax. Let's do the third set. We'll bend our knees, clench the buttocks, firm your tummy. Let's hold that, focusing on trying to maintain that contraction. And now relax. Let's bend the knees, clench the buttocks, firm your tummy. Control that contraction. Focus on maintaining it. And now relax. But one more set. Let's bend your knees, moderately firm your buttocks, tighten your tummy. And just focus on trying to sustain that contraction. And now relax. Well done. So we'll repeat those movements again. Let's bend backwards. Pay attention to the sensations. Now let's bend forwards again and pay attention to the sensation in the lower back. That's great. For some of us, you may have felt a lower intensity of sensation and a mild improvement in the quality of your movement. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, I'd like to leave you with these three messages. Improve your sleep quality, manage your stress levels, but most importantly, get active and stay active. So thank you for your time. Next slide, please. Our clinic, In Touch Physiotherapy, is in the RB Capital Building in Raffles Place. You can check out the services we offer at our website. And I can be reached personally at michael at intouchphysio.com. Uh, if you have any questions, but also if anyone would like a list of the scientific references that I've used in this presentation, particularly the ones related to the health benefits of exercise, uh, please email me and I can send you a detailed list. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. All right. So, Tizzy, could we please? There we go. All right. So, uh, Dr. Tim, would you? There you go. All right. Everyone's on now. So if you have any questions at the moment or if you, you'd like to know further about either of the presentations, you can just pop your questions into the question box now on the right-hand side. If you can just address the, the speaker, so you could say this question is for Tim or this question is for Michael, and then we can uh, take it from there. Okay, so we've just got three questions so far. Okay, four questions. Okay, so let's let's start with our first question. Then would be for uh, for you, Michael. Um, so we have someone who has asked how to have a speedy recovery of a frozen shoulder. My orthopedic and physiotherapist said it would take eighteen months to recover a frozen shoulder. Sure. Um, so frozen shoulder, 
is is the uh, layman's term for adhesive capsulitis. Uh, it's, it's it's not a very pleasant condition. Uh, it's an inflammatory condition that uh, is is what we call idiopathic, and that's the scientific word for we actually don't know what causes it. Um, it has some correlation with autoimmune diseases like diabetes mellitus or thyroid conditions. And it's also has some relationship with uh, post-traumatic inflammatory disorders. Some people get it after surgery or after severe shoulder problems. Um, so apart from those uh, things that we don't know, uh, the actual progression of the disease is also uh, not clear, but the best hypotheses at the moment suggest it, 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 it progresses through three phases. Um, the first phase is called the freezing phase, and this is often the most painful and symptomatic where the inflammatory process is at, is at its peak uh, and the shoulder is very, becomes very, very stiff and very painful to move. Um, that usually lasts for three to nine months. The, the second phase is called the frozen phase, and that's characterized by a reduction in the inflammatory component, but the shoulder remains very stiff and immobile. And the third phase is the thawing phase. And this is basically where the movement slowly gets restored and your muscular strength and control is restored. Um, your physiotherapist and orthopedic are correct. We know that uh, this, this problem is, is self-limiting and it usually resolves in 12 to 24 months. So it's not, it's not a very optimistic prognosis, but this is, this is the nature of that condition. We also know that uh, physical therapy, physiotherapy can be useful. Uh, however, it needs, to be, it needs to be performed judiciously. So early in, in the first and second phases, aggressive manual therapy can actually flare things up. Its, it's greatest effect can happen in the third phase. Um, and you're encouraged to simply maintain your available range of motion with some gentle passive exercises and try and maintain some muscle strength by doing some isometric contractions, which is not dissimilar to what we did. An isometric contraction means activating your muscles without moving the joint. And you can do that very easily with your shoulder against the wall or using your own fist. Uh, but apart from that, a lot of it is encouragement, pain management, and, and believing in the fact that you will get better. Um, yes. I think that answers the question and um, also for me personally, Michael, you know that earlier this year I had a shoulder injury and what we did is you basically gave me a program that I worked through it like a, a, I like to call myself like a soldier. I, I did it twice a day regimentally with an elastic band and I isolated and built the strength up in my shoulder and I've made a full recovery but it did take time, it took effort. So. Well done, Michael. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. So the next question is for you then, Dr. Tim. Um, when should we start worrying about posture and ergonomics in children? Well, <clears throat> um, the, the simple answer is quite young, um, especially when kids are growing. You know, they're, if, they're, if they're growing in an active way and posture isn't a problem, then they're probably going to grow strong. They're going to grow in balance. And we need to be in balance as as we go through as we go through life. You know, disease is a loss of a loss of ease in the system. And when you are out of alignment, then you're going to be inefficient in gravity. And joints, weight bearing joints that are out of alignment are the ones that can become arthritic, whether it's your knees, your hips, or all your spinal joints. So if you want your kids to reach their potential in life, you really want to encourage them to grow up with, with, with good posture. So, you know, I, I really do think you should start young. We started our kids bouncing on balls and trampolines and at a very, 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 very young age. And so you know, I think that you should have an awareness right from the start. So, you know, I mean, really, when babies start, they're crawling and then they pick up their neck and they, they develop a neck curve. And then they sit up, they develop a low back curve, you know? So this posture starts right at the beginning. So there's my answer. You know, you, you need to have an awareness. You need to encourage balance, uh, core strength, and help them be as good as they can be. Michael's absolutely correct. There is no perfect posture. 
movement is the key thing, but movement, if you can maintain your life and help them maintain their life close to the gravity line, which is the, the this, this line that runs down the middle, then gravitational forces will be, will be kind to them. If they're, if they, as they grow up, going through life, if you live a, much of your life away from the gravity line, the stresses are going to build up and they'll, you know, they, they'll be stiff and they'll, they won't age well. So start young. That's my advice. I, I think that's great advice. And to all the parents listening, I, I think uh, over the weekend, you should encourage your kids to get out and get active. Um, so the next question then is, is for you again, uh, Michael. This one is regarding, um, I'll, I'll read it in full here. It says, do I need to have surgery if I rupture the anterior cruciate ligament in my knee? So some people might know it as an ACL. That's a good question, Michael. Um, fortunately, the evidence base on this injury is is uh, almost conclusive now. Um, longitudinal studies performed in Sweden over a 20-year period, uh, it has deduced that if someone ruptures their ACL, to optimise their, their five to 10 year outcome, uh, they should delay surgery regardless of any other injury in the knee. And the reason for this delay in surgery is to let the inflammation settle down and to restore the capacity back in the muscles around your knee. Um, and during that restoration, there'll be a progression of rehabilitation where you can start performing more demanding activities and then, and only then, a decision on surgical intervention can be made. There are some people we now know that can function completely fine without an ACL. Uh, further to that is that there are some people, even without an ACL, make the decision to modify their lifestyle, and that modification is only mild, so they don't stress their knee while they don't have an ACL. So it's a bit more multifactorial. Um, if, if your surgeon says you need surgery straight away, the evidence, uh, the evidence points towards that. That's not the, that's not the best practice. So um, if you have any family or friends that ever rupture their ACL, the best thing you should do is delay surgery for three months, get stronger, get mobile, then let your physiotherapist decide whether or not your capacities are functional enough to cope with your future sporting and activity goals. And if it's not, if you're experiencing ongoing instability and pain, then surgery may be an option. Yeah, it's not as clear cut as we used to think uh, even five years ago. Uh, I, th I think it's also, it's important to note then that a rupture and a complete torn ligament is it's quite different, isn't it? Uh, um, no, Michael, sorry, it's not, it's the same. A, a rupture uh, or even a, a tear, a tear uh, is a, is a is the, the layman's term, but a tear also reflects a complete separation. Right. Um, only, only if uh, adjectives like partial tear are used, uh, then it's the part of the ligament is still intact. But generally speaking, on particularly on reports of uh, imaging investigations like MRI scans, uh, they will say a tear or a rupture. That means a complete disruption. Um, the, the report will say a partial tear if there are some fibres of that structure intact. Okay, good. Well, I, I hope that that's cleared up that myth for anyone else who, who thought they yeah. were different. So, um, yeah. I've just had another question come in from a runner. So, uh, this person says, um, I've been running 10 kilometres once a week at a slow pace for more than 15 years. Should this change one a once a person is in their late 40s? And should any precautions be taken to ensure there's no long-term injury from the wear and tear? So, um, Michael, I think if you could touch on that. Sure. Uh, most definitely not. Absolutely not. Uh, running is one of the most magnificent things you can do. Uh, there's a lot of myth about uh, running and its supposed cause of injury. Um, no, running, running is amazing. It's actually running, running can reduce your risk of developing osteoarthritis. This is a, a complete myth. Uh, so what I suggest, um, if you're running once a week for 10 Ks and you're currently coping with that fine, I, I urge you to continue that. A suggestion would be as, as you get a bit older uh, is to perhaps combine some basic resistance training 
to fortify your musculoskeletal system. And you don't necessarily have to join a gym for that. You can do lots of uh, body weight exercises or TheraBand resistance work. But what's even, uh, the evidence tells us what's even better is if you increase your frequency of running. So what would give you even more health benefits, like I outlined in, in my presentation, uh, if you increased your frequency to two or three times a week and perhaps just dropped your, your duration a little bit until you built back up to that 10 kilometres, uh, the health benefits would be amazing as, as you progress in further decades of your life. Very good. I think that's a very comprehensive answer for, for that question. Um, well, we have time for, I think, just one more question then. Uh, Dr. Tim, for you, uh, it's come through and they say a spinal adjustment, which felt more forceful, I uh, had with a chiropractor for my lower back pain, seemed to only aggravate the pain further after two or three sessions. Are these methods of adjustment safe? When you, when you manipulate a, um, a spinal joint, you, we're being very specific with the joints that we're manip manipulating. We are restoring function. And whenever there's any lesion in the body, there's always going to be inflammation. There's always going to be fibrosis. And it's very, very, very important that we restore function because with that function, you're restoring blood supply, you're restoring the natural reflexes, etc. But there is a process. We, we are trying to evoke change. And if you've got an inflamed joint, then it can cause a little bit of discomfort or pain. And sometimes we have to work our way through it. Usually when we manipulate these joints, there is an immediate, immediate feeling of relief. Um, but there can be, and that's why dialogue with the doctor is very important. That's why we use other modalities and we work with, a, with our rehab, rehab specialist. And why we use ice, because if we do something and it, and it uh, stirs up, if you like, the, the hornet's nest and there's a little bit more inflammation, then that's physiology. That's the body giving you a symptom or a sign. It's communicating with you. So we have to always listen to the body. So you know, my, my advice, if that is the case, is talk to your chiropractor. I don't know the history. I don't know the problem. I haven't seen your films. I, you know, I, I don't know what we're talking about here. However, it's a communication thing between yourself and the doctor. Um, usually it's something that we can work through with some simple uh, stretches and strengthening and, and other modalities like, like ice. Um, and it's something that we very quickly get through. But, you know, the healing, there, is, there are phases. And in the acute phase, acute means it's, it's, it's very recent. It's going to be inflamed. So that, that it's just natural physiology to have a little bit of pain. So I think communication with the doctor is the most important thing. That's key advice. And also just simply listening to your body, as you say. If something's wrong, Absolutely. your body will tell you. Wait. Right, good. Well, we, we don't have any more questions coming through. And I'm mindful it's just touched one o'clock. So, uh, Tizzy, could we please go forth to the next slide? Very good. All right, so everyone that's on the call, thank you very much for joining us. I'm just going to briefly give us a, an overview of St. James's Place, just roughly. So um, as a company, we were founded in 1991, and we're a FTSE 100 company. We have 700,000 clients who entrust us to manage their, their investments and their assets to the tune of 205 billion Singapore dollars. Um, we have offices across Asia, in Hong Kong, the UK, um, Singapore and China. So wherever you may be in Asia, we'll be able to assist you. Why these 700,000 clients have entrusted us comes down to our distinctive approach to investment management and our advice guarantee, where we guarantee the suitability of the advice given to our clients. Um, now I'd like to just touch on our charitable foundation. Um, so our charitable foundation has donated about 100 billion, 100 million sterling, not billion, million, sterling uh, to numerous causes over the uh, past 20 years. And so in Singapore, we actively give to Boys Town, Smile, 
and Rainbow. So if you guys would like to learn more about our uh, charitable foundation, as well as about St. James's Place itself, um, we're going to launch a poll now. And if you could just simply click yes or no on that poll, uh, we can provide you with more information about St. James's Place, about our charitable foundation, and also about our further upcoming events. So please just click simply yes if you'd like to learn more about uh, St. James's Place or about the future programs and initiatives we have. And if you would not like to learn more about that, just simply click no, no problem. So I'll just wait for a few people to come through. All right. Very good. All right, Tizzy, thank you so much. You can close the poll. All right, um, on to the next slide, please. So everyone, um, thanks very much. Our upcoming events, as I said, this is a uh, series that we'll be hosting on the Survival Guide to Working From Home. Um, if you'd like to learn more from professionals in this realm of expertise and beyond, please join us for the next one where we'll have Colin O'Shea, who is a coach and Ironman triathlete. He is a, he's a heck of an athlete. Um, and he is going to be talking to us about not only keeping your body healthy and staying active, but more importantly, having the winning mindset and how to set goals and smash them. So if you'd like to learn more about that, please do scan this QR code on the screen now. Um, during the course of September, we'll be doing a webinar on UK pensions, where we'll be talking about your options, both before retirement and after retirement, about the taxation thereof, etc. If you'd like to learn more about that, uh, please do watch this space. Uh, 14th of October, we'll be talking about the Australian taxes and the updates. So tax considerations for Aussie expats while they're offshore. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about any of this, drop us an email at fwprograms at sjpp.asia. So without uh, taking much more of anyone's time here, I'd just like to say thank you very much to our two experts for joining us, Dr. Tim, Michael, thank you for your time. And we'll end the webinar there. So thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see you soon. Well done, guys. That was good.